How's everybody? I love listening to Mark. You know, you listen to Mark and it's like, you know, everything's going to be all right. If you can't listen to Jesus, listen to Mark. It's, yeah, it's going to be all right. It's going to be good. Well, I hope you're doing good. We are, uh, this is just going to be the last message on Why Church, which I think has been a great series. If you've missed uh, one or more of them, uh, I would encourage you to go online. Just really, really good stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about something today uh, concerning the church. Uh, just kind of play with two words, uh, return and revisit. Um, say those words, return and revisit. And remember, when we talk about the church, we're never talking about the building. We're never talking about a building. Historically, that's what it's been referred to. But remember, we've, and we've talked about this at length, that the body of Christ is the church. The called out ones are the church. The ecclesia is the church. It's not the building. You decimate this building today, hopefully while we're not in it. Um, but if, it, if you got rid of this building today, the church would still be strong and vibrant, and the presence of Jesus would be here, because uh, it has nothing to do with the building. We just, this is just a tool. We just use it. You know, Anthony and Anu from India are going to be here this month. They are here, and they're going to be here this month, yeah. And uh, so they'll be sharing. But they told me about a month ago, a month and a half ago, in the town that they're at, they closed one of the biggest churches in that city. Closed it in. I mean, literally, it was short work. They just went in, made a few threats, and shut it down. And it was over. But how many of you know, you know, you can shut a church building down. You can shut a denomination down. But you don't shut the church down. Because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, gates of hell, or any authorities are not going to prevail against it. So, in fact, historically, let me just let you in on a little secret, that the more persecuted the church, the people of God is, the stronger the church becomes. That's historically. So, I, want to, I just want to talk about those two things there. I want to, you know, normally, I'm somebody who, I like to look forward. I don't like to look back. I'm not a big navel gazer. I don't want to spend hours and hours, oh, God, something's wrong with me. I got problems. I got sin. Oh, Jesus, you know, let's, you know, I, don't, I don't want to do that. I want to keep my eyes locked on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. I also know there is a value in glancing back once in a while. Let us examine our ways and return to the Lord, Lamentations 3.20 says. So there is profit in looking back at strategic times, at key times, to examine. And so, with your permission, can I go a little deeper today? Can I examine and scrutinize maybe just a little bit more intensely? Is that okay? Okay, you said it. You gave me permission. You heard it. And I'll tell you, examinations aren't fun. I had, and this is TMI for 11.59 in the morning, but two months ago, I noticed something on my chest that was getting really discolored. You know, it was a mole, and it was turning colors, and it was dark and purple, and so I went to my doctor, Google, and I looked it up, and I matched pictures, and it confirmed that I needed to go to the doctor. So I, I go to the doctor. First, I take pictures and send it to a few trusted friends. What is this? What do you think this is? And get feedback. Go to a doctor. So I go to a doctor. And I go in there, and I'm sitting in there, and he comes. He goes, oh, hey, how you doing? Good. Yeah, great. Take your shirt off. Oh, really? Okay. You know, because it's right here. So got to take my shirt off. His female assistant comes in. You know, it's like, oh. So I'm just... The only thing I'm saying is examinations are uncomfortable. And then he pulled the big light, you know, the big light, pulled it right down there. And now I'm just like fully exposed. He goes, oh, yeah, we got to take that out. And I went, geez, okay. And so he goes, oh, this is going to hurt, you know. And so he gives me, so he pulls the needle from down here, you know. So as you know, it's going to hurt. He doesn't like wave it around. He pulls it down here. He goes, hey, so tell me what's been happening in Haiti. I said, oh, this is where you distract me before you like, Ern. he goes, no, 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 no. Ah, oh, God, you did that. And so he proceeded, he goes, yeah, we're going to have to take that out. And so he corded out, and seven stitches later, yeah, he took a chunk out, man. And uh, you know what? It was awkward and it was uncomfortable, but I'll tell you right now, I'm glad he did. So sit back, let's shine the light a little bit and uh, see what we find. <laughs> Matthew 28, Matthew 28. And, and once again, I just came from a horrible week two weeks ago. I was on a cruise ship. No, I'm telling you, it's, it's a blessing and it's good, but there's something really wrong with it. Because when you're on a cruise ship, how many of you have been on a cruise ship? Can I see your hands? Okay, you're on a flotilla of consumption. That's all it is. It is, you know, it's the good ship, me, myself, and I, and food, and buffets, and banquet, and entertainment, just to feed you. And simultaneously, as this indulgence thing is happening, 
I download one book, and the book is The End of Me. <laughs> and it's about self-sacrifice. And it's about being poured out like a drink offering. It's about losing your life for Jesus. It's about getting out of the way. It's about forgetting you. As plates of food are walking by, I mean, just all this. I'm, I'm telling you, it was really a paradox. It was a dichotomy. It was hard to live in that tension. So I don't know what you're going to get today, but you're going to get something. Matthew 28, verse 1. Let's look at returning and revisiting. After the Sabbath at dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Some of you are thinking, wait, is it Easter? No, it's not. It's legal. We can use these verses at other times besides Easter. I checked. I prayed. It's legal. So don't get all nervous. We should be in Luke too. It's almost December. Calm down. Okay? Everything is going to be okay. Matthew 28 verse 1 is okay at the end of November. Trust me. Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake. And an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back to stone, and sat on it. Okay, this gets my attention. Angel moves the tomb, sits on it, don't know what his posture is. You know, if he's just kind of folding his arm, legs, you know, like, yeah, what'd you think of that? Or, you know, is it kind of like an intense, you know, smug deal? I don't know, you know, but th there's an angel that comes, man, and rolls back to stone and sits on it. Now, what you need to know is, and what you, a lot of you do know, but... In the Gospels, where you see people sitting down, it's usually rabbis, teachers, rulers, kings, people in authority. So when you sit down, you are the one that has the authority. When this angel sits down, he's got the authority. You know, you come from heaven, you roll a tomb away, stone away, you, you got the authority. So he's got his authority. He's sitting there. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and become like dead men. Now, when I see this, you know, um, here, here's part of my thought. This is really totally unnecessary. You know, I mean, is it really necessary for an angel to come, you know, just comet to the planet, roll in a tomb away? I mean, is that really necessary stuff? Because, you know, the Gospels would show that Jesus has no problem in his resurrected body walking through walls. There's no problem there. So why go to all this unnecessary trouble to send an angel and do all this, Jesus didn't need that. And, you know, as I look at that, I think, you know, Jesus didn't need that, but we needed that. We needed to look at this. This needs to be a historical reference point, which I would say is the beginning of the backbone of the church, Matthew 28, these first few verses here. And so this is for our benefit. And the, and the, and the guards, they shake. They're afraid. They're like dead men. We don't have time to go into all the why of that, but, you know, the short version is if you're sent to guard somebody, you're commissioned to guard, and they escape, you get crucified. Game over, okay? It's not a long debate. They know that. That's, you know, it's the angel as much as their death sentence that they're shaken about. Now, here's the deal. These things happen for us. We read these stories that are really awe-inspiring because you and I need to be awestruck by God. You and I really need to, to not reduce God, the word of God, and the spirit of God to some doctrinal formula or some dogma or just some philosophy. These things are written here for us, you know, to just be captivated by, to look at these things and just go, this is amazing. Because when you and I see these kinds of things, I'll tell you what it does. It strikes at the heart of nominalism. And I will tell you that there's a gravitational pull, there always has been and there always will be, a gravitational pull for the body of Christ to become nominal about the things of God. Nominalism, where you and I settle for religion, where we settle for religious practices, where we settle for lifeless liturgies. Not that liturgies are lifeless, but they can be. And when Jesus said, you know, don't pray with vain repetitions, he didn't say repetitious prayer is bad. He's saying, he's saying vain repetitions of prayer is not life-giving. So there's a pull for all of us, every single person here. I feel it sometimes too, this gravitational pull, you know, just to be nominal, to settle for religion, to adopt a been there, done that mentality. And I tell you, I, I, the people I am most concerned with are the people that have been around the spiritual block for a few years. People that have been Christians for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, but yet haven't experienced the life of God. 
And so there's kind of a been there, done that mentality, you know, Bible study. Yeah, you know, I used to go to Bible study or community or fellowship. Yeah, yeah I used to do that. You know, yeah, I, I know I should go more. But, you know, I, I've been, I, you know, been there and I've done those things, you know. That's a death sentence. When you start, when you start being over familiar with the things of God, that's a death sentence. A death sentence of nominalism. Been there, done that. You know, I've already experienced that. Yeah, I, I know. You know, bless, bless their hearts. You know, young people there, they jump around. They'll, you know, one day they'll get older and get over it. Hopefully not. I'll tell you this. As a 63-year-old, you missed a great opportunity to say, you don't look it. Um, as a 63-year-old, I will just tell you, I have no, never been more excited about Jesus, the things of God, the purposes of God, and the will of God than right now. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to fight that good fight of nominalism, man. I am going to shake at that thing. I am going to run from that thing. And I am going to embrace some of the awesomeness that God has. Because I don't think, I don't think our seniority date of salvation has, has to be the end of our spiritual life. You know, what does nominal mean? The word nominal means existing in name only. I don't want to just be a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, fill it on on some form. Religion, Christian. Name only, Christian. Having a form of godliness but denying the power. Nominalism. Settle. You know, pray, but yeah, don't, don't really expect a lot. I mean, pray because it's a good thing. You know, be nice. Be polite. You're a Christian. Get a sticker. Put it on your car. A little fish sticker. I think I'll stop right there. I know me. I know where I can go. Not a good place to go. No. The enemy would love for you to, yeah, go visit a country. Don't disciple a nation. Yeah, go visit. You know, go, go give a few turkeys away. But don't make disciples. Go do a few good deeds so you can feel good and Advertise the latest good work. Yeah, okay. Settle. Settle for that. Worse than that, live vicariously off somebody else that has a relationship with God. Well, I'm, I'm close to him, and he really knows God. So therefore, I'm kind of close in proximity. His walk, her walk is her walk, his walk, your walk is your walk. Where are you? Where are you at? Nominal. Hate that word. Hate that when it creeps into me. Hey, well, I, I've been in ministry for 32 years. Oh, my gosh, gag. <laughs> I'm thankful, but sometimes like, really, that, that's all you got? <laughs> I got an office that I share with Mark. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Nick takes my desk, but. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's like. Yeah, do some good things, but the enemy doesn't want you to actually take dominion. Do a ritual, but don't take dominion. Go to a country, but don't actually think of influencing the country. I mean, really influencing it. This is just kind of the stuff that's working on me. Nominal. I don't want to be nominal. The word says the kingdom of God does not exist in word only, but in power. Word's great. Love the word. Love to recite the word, love to quote the word, love to read the word, need the power of God. You, you go to neighborhoods, go to your business, go to other countries, words are great. They need power. Jesus demonstrated those steps for us to follow. If power wasn't necessary, if it was only doctrine and religion, that's all he would have gave. And then the word would have said how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth who went about Talking about the word. That's great. And that could have been it, but he didn't do that. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed to the devil because God was with him. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not preach a three-point sermon. And I like three-point sermons. If they're good three-point sermons. You know, I mean, something happened in, in Pakistan last time. There was, one, there was one meeting I did, and I just, once again, want to make a big point here. 500 people, and the difference between some of these other countries 
and us is, if we say, we're going to have a line for prayer, line up, there would be nice orderly lines that people would come, you know, because we're American, and that's what you do. You get in a nice line, you file away, you know, and boom, pray, and good, thank you, God bless you. Um, but you go to some of these other really poor countries, they don't care about lines. They don't even know what a line is. It's like, hey, I'd like to pray for you. Come on forward. Whoa! And they just smash you, and you got people all over you. They're pulling on you. I mean, I had people just pulling. Like, I'm praying. I'm, stop it. And they're, <laughs> they're pulling. And they're, they're desperate and desperate. And, and I would just say this. The answer to the question when anybody asks you, why does it th- seem like more things happen in other countries? I will tell you this, and I could be wrong. We can debate about it. But I can tell you that impoverished countries are more desperate. They're desperate. And there's something about desperate people and the way desperate people pray. Do you remember when you were desperate? Do you remember how you prayed? Before sophistication crept in? No. You know, oh, Lord, you now know. Back then it was, you got to heal me. You got to deliver me. I'm in trouble. Yeah, go back to praying like that. So in this one meeting, and this lady comes there, and she's just in the middle of people, and I just went to pray. Didn't even know what she needed prayer for, and I just went like this, and I said, Father, in the name, and all of a sudden, as I close my eyes, you know in Acts where it says the sound, the, the Holy Spirit came like the sound of a rushing mighty wind? I can tell you that's what happened, except it wasn't the sound, it was the feeling of a rushing mighty wind, and as soon as I got to her head, it was like I, my eyes were closed, but I felt this whoosh, just go through, and she was catapulted on top of a bunch of people, and her eyes were all pie-eyed, you know, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know what that is, but good, good on you, and went on and prayed and everything, and, and I, think about, I think about the words that my, my friend in Singapore said. He said, you know, you need to celebrate the I don't knowness of God. I'm not trying to figure it out. I just know someone, something, the Spirit of God picked her up and threw her down, have no idea what it was about. But I knew it was God, and it was awe-inspiring. Let me just say this. I don't chase experiences. Sorry. Call me a bad charismatic. I don't. I don't I'm not looking for experiences. I'm looking to follow Jesus. And when I follow Jesus, experiences happen. Frequency, up to him, not me. I'm following. I'll pray for 1,000 people. If nothing happens, I'll pray for the next 1,000. Somebody is going to get something if I keep praying. And you, you should have that mindset, too. I don't, get, I don't care if I prayed for 50 people and they all died. I'm still going. Well, maybe you should get somebody to help you. Yeah, maybe I should. But the point is, I'm not going to stop. I am not going to stop. I'm going to contend for life, man, all the days of my life. That's what I'm going to do. And the results are up to him. The experiences, they come and go. Awesome. I'm not chasing them. You don't chase them either. Chase Jesus. Follow Jesus. You'll get experiences. I feel so better. I feel mo' better. Okay, verse 5, boom. I'm going to have Abel come up in a couple minutes here. Not yet, though, because I want him to share some things here. But I want you to see what happens here. Verse 8. Oh, no, verse 5. Angel said to the woman, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where they lay. Then go quickly tell his disciples. He's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. Everybody say Galilee. Significant. There you will see him. Now I have told you. You know, think about what you have to offer. A lot of young people, a lot of young Christians get hung up. Well, I don't know enough of the Bible. I don't know about this, and I haven't experienced that and everything. I just got to wait till I get more equipped and more trained, and I have more knowledge. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, somewhere around 15, 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation. As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach. God only asks you to give what you have. You don't give what you don't have. You give what you do have. And if it's a little, the anointing of God can stretch the little that you have into significant stuff. I mean, significant. But here's what, you know, when I go to other countries, I'm getting ready to go to one soon, and you'll hear about it next week, I think. Um, But I think about, I take the word of the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is good news. The part of the gospel are these things just read. Jesus was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. Go to Galilee. He's going to meet you there. What? You're going to see him. Okay, so is Jesus experiential? Yes. Yes. This is the gospel. You know what else I take when I go? I take my personal story. You all have a personal story in God, right? A personal story of salvation, true? A personal experience of some form of freedom or deliverance, encouragement, or building up that Jesus did for you, true? That's what you give. You know what else I give? 
I give your experiences. It's amazing. If you could just kind of crawl in my brain sometimes when I'm praying over people, there's a Rolodex that's spinning. When somebody says, I have a son that has this, da 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 all of a sudden, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking of who has been healed or delivered or been set free from that thing there. And a lot of times when I pray, I'll say, let me tell you about somebody that I know at our church. And I'll just tell, I'll tell your story. And they'll be encouraged. And then I'll pray. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Stories are powerful. Anointed stories are powerful. That's, just tell a story. I've told my story, and if you've been here, you know my story. Basically, I was an alcoholic for 10 years, okay? Just kind of a shipwrecked, hedonistic fool. And I got radically saved. And I got on the side of my bed, and I prayed for deliverance from alcohol because I didn't know another Christian. I just had the Gospels and what Jesus did, and I had a hope that he could do what he did back then, and he did. And, you know, I've told that story in every country I've been to. And airplanes all over the world, atheists, agnostics, believers, backslidden people. And, you know, not one person has ever debated me. Not one person has ever said, ah, you know what? I'm not sure if that really happened. Not one. I'm talking about atheists. There's a few of them. I'm telling the story. I'm thinking, whoa, buddy. They've already told me where they're at. And not one. You know why? Because what Jesus did in your life is anointed. And anointing breaks yokes of bondages. And you just share it. You just share. You let, let, let it fall where it may, but you share. You're responsible for what you share. Man, that's just good stuff right there. And then you give resources. You give resources. Let me tell you something. You know what I love about everything that was mentioned here? Turkeys, lunch, uh, Texas barbecue, um, all that kind of stuff. You know what I love about it? I love about it is that we're not a church that only does that stuff once a year. I love that. I love that this is just rhythmic of who we are. This is just another thing that we do. And I'll tell you this. I don't believe the gospel was ever meant to be empty-handed. I don't. Unless that's the way Jesus modeled it, but he didn't model it that way. He went about, and he preached, and he prayed, and he did good, and he made a lot of lunch for a lot of hungry people several times. Potluck sponsored by Jesus. No church, and there's more than enough. He gave, man. I, I don't the, the God, preach the gospel, absolutely, but it's not empty-handed. We give. We serve. I'm, I'm going to tell you one fun, funny story. I'm sharing a story of somebody else, and it will encourage you. So this friend of mine is on the border of uh, Iraq and Syria right now, and he's ministering to refugees that are coming out of, out of Syria, and uh, there's Kurds and Syrians, and it's, it's a mess, and there's you know, it's supposed to be 300,000 people that are coming across these borders, and it's kind of crazy and messed up. And uh, so I'm talking to him this week a couple times, and, and he's telling me he's living. He says, I, dude, I've been sleeping one hour a night. I said, you kidding me? I said, who's there with you? Who's helping you? He goes, oh, you know, I got one guy, and, you know, got to confess, man, I've had a really bad attitude. I go, really? Okay, what's happening? He goes, well, this guy's great. He's from another country, and, you know, he's kind of simple. He's kind of like Forrest Gump, you know, and so you get the picture. And he goes, but for some reason, when we're praying for healing for people, you know, these refugees, and there's you know, thousands, and we're praying, he just wants to stop and say, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, where's your pain level? Where was it before we prayed? Is it a 9? Is it a 7? Okay, let's see if we can get it down to a 4. And so he's doing this thing, and my friend is just confessing to me. He says, I got a bad attitude, man. I'm getting a bad attitude. I'm thinking, we don't have time to do the little scale, 1 to 10. Where are you at? How are you feeling? So Move this body, you know. And so he finally tells the guy, look, you got to stop. I mean, look at all these people. We, we do not have time to do the little scale of healing here. We got to pray. He goes, you can, you can do that thing twice a day from here on out. That's all you get to do, twice a day. And the guy's very simple, you know, humble. Godly guy, okay? And so he says, the next day, we go to pray for people. <laughs> and he prays for this guy. We're praying for people. He prays for this guy, and he steps back, and he goes, okay, on a scale of A to Z. <laughs> and my friend is ready to like, he goes, but listen to how God humbled me. He goes, he has an opportunity to pray for an army a general in the army over there whose back is severely messed up. And this guy lays hands on the general, prays for him, and the guy gets healed. And my buddy's like, kill me now. Just kill me now. That's how God deals with people, isn't it? 
You think you got the high ground? You're going to, oh, we're not going to do it like that. Blah, blah, blah. Forget about it. No way. All right, let's close with this. I want to just hear this. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped their feet, worshiped him. Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me. Now, isn't th those two words there, they were totally afraid, yet they were filled with joy. I think that's the tension we're called to live in. See, a lot of times when we talk about faith, we think, well, I have enough faith when I don't have any fear. But you know what? You just take a cursory walk through the Gospels, and you know what you will see? Devoted men, men and women of God who love Jesus who are afraid. You will see Jesus full of apprehension in the Garden of Gethsemane. A person that lives their Christian life without any fear is someone who is locked up in their comfort zone. And they're, that's just my personal opinion. I think they're in a comfortable place. I don't think they're risking much. I don't think they're believing for much. I don't believe they're going in any dangerous situation. I don't believe they're laying their reputation on the line. I don't believe they're confronting darkness. I believe they're playing it safe. I think this, this is the tension we need to get comfortable with. And I've, I, I, once again, I've been in other countries, and it's like all of a sudden you look around and you go, you know, there's some things that could go really upside down really quick. And there's that kind of fear that creeps in. But then there's the, wow, this is pretty cool because God could do something really significant and amazing. And so you live in this like, what could happen? Yeah, what could happen? And so you know what he tells them? He tells them, go tell my brothers. I love it. Jesus shows up sh suddenly, and he says, greetings. I don't know why that's funny. Picturing Jesus. Greetings. <laughs> you know, like. How you doing, girls? You know, greetings. That just seems so non-majestic, but <laughs> greetings. Go to Galilee. And so you think, why would he say go to Galilee? Galilee is a nothing place. And I've been there. It's still a nothing place. It was a nothing place. It's the place where the Pharisees said, when they talked in John 7-ish, yeah, John 7, 52, yeah, sure, we'll go with that. They talked about him being a prophet. They said, a prophet coming out of Galilee? Are you crazy? My paraphrase. Unthinkable. Prophets don't come out of Galilee. It's a nothing place. Why would Jesus tell them to go to Galilee when Jerusalem is the spiritual hub, the spiritual center, the seat of spiritual authority, and he tells them to go back to a, a nothing place? I'll tell you why. And this is where return and revisit come into your purview. Because Galilee was the first place they encountered Jesus for the first time where he spoke to them, the first time where they followed him, the first time where, they, where he commissioned them, the first time. I would suggest to us that there are times where we need to rewind the tape in our thinking and go, you know what, I need to go back to that first place where I encountered Jesus, especially if there's a lot of baggage and clutter that has crept into your life. There's a time where you go back and you just say, what was it like when I first came to Jesus and the joy that was there and nothing else mattered? Do you remember that time? That's a time to revisit. That's a time to go back to. Or we'll settle for religious nominalism. And I just don't think that's good. Abel, why don't you come on up here? Because I, I, I have known this guy here. Give him a hand. Um, <laughs> The reason I asked him is because he, come, he comes out of a, a stream that was, was very religious and, you know, I'm not going to speak for him or get into that, but I knew he would have a perspective on the whole, you know, religion versus relationship. And so, man, why don't you just share a couple things? Yeah. Thanks, Pastor Bob. Good morning. Now, I, uh, I love that story about the cruise so much. Uh, my wife's here. I, I just want to let you know in between services, I booked us a cruise. Um, I want to I want to experience this festival. <laughs> so I want to I want to shine um, another light as Pastor Bob referred to just the examination, right? I want to I want to shine another light on on the returning to the love, right? To our first love. Uh, in the Book of Revelation, Jesus says you you you've left your first love. Um, and two questions that I want to kind of ask today is what happens if we're not engaged in our first love? If I'm not engaged in my first love, what am I engaged in? And the second question is, are, are there some consequences to that? Is there, are there some consequences of, of living apart from Christ? And so those are the two things that we're going to kind of take a look at together. 
Um, you know, I had a friend of mine a while ago tell me about the story of a husband and wife, and the uh, they're both in their you know in bed and they're winding down after a long day, and the husband's on the computer right working away, and the wife is reading a book, and he just nonchalantly you know kind of as he's working he says, hey honey, can you go get me a sandwich? And he keeps working, and she stops, shuts the book, sets it down, looks over at him and says, I want a divorce. And I'm like. Gosh, I've asked my wife like a million times for sandwiches. I didn't realize that that was such a dangerous question to ask. <laughs> Second of all, I always ask my wife when I ask her for a sa sandwich. I'm like, you're, you're good, right? I mean, like, how are you feeling right now? Like, you, we're, we're still good, right? Now, I, I, I tell the story not to make light of divorce or, you know, the, the, the splitting and stuff like that. But I, I tell the story to, to say that drifting apart isn't something that's intentional. Nobody ever sets out to get married, right, and says, hey, you know what, after a couple of years, I'm just going to let it go, and I'm just going to stop loving this person, right? Nor does somebody uh, end a relationship when it's good, right? I've never heard anybody say, man, you know, my wife is amazing. She lets me go out with the boys whenever I want, do whatever I want, but I, I'm going to divorce her so she can go and be a blessing to somebody else, <laughs> right? Like, it's never intentional, and, and there's always this, th there's this, um, there's this issue of, of drifting and not realizing that we're drifting. So as, as I was looking at this, I, I, I found this um, phrase of, of legal separation, and I have a, um, we have a definition of it. Now, legal separation is a situation where you're no longer living with the spouse, but you remain legally married. And I was thinking, isn't that exactly what Christ is talking about in Revelation? We've drifted. We're still, we think we're still in covenant, but there's not really much of a relationship that's left. See, we, we have this in, uh, in Christianity. We, we, we have this in Christianity, right? But we don't, it's not called legal separation. We call it something else. So the, to answer the first question of, if I'm not engaged in my first love, what am I engaged in? And the answer to that is I'm engaged in religion. You know, when we, when we move, you know, when we honor the bond, but not the person, that's when we move from a covenantial relationship to a contractual relationship, right? And let me just say, I mean, I've, I've been there, and as Pastor Bob alluded, I, I've been there and, and, and lived a majority of, you know, growing up in religion. And can I just say that one of the things that kind of keeps people in that and kept me in that is, man, I just wanted fire insurance, I wasn't really interested in the relationship. I just wanted fire insurance. I just wanted to get to heaven. Jesus says in Mark 7, 6, he says he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites as it's written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So there's this relationship. that there's, we, we want the kingdom without the king. Does that make sense? We're living at a place of, of kingdom benefit, with, but we, we're really not interested in engaging with the king. Um, where's my... Here we go. So this is my definition of religion. There we go, I found it. Religion happens when we respond to the call of God but lose the passion for his voice somewhere along the journey. Right? The whole notion of returning means that I was there at some point. Right? I started out right, and I kind of journeyed too far. I love what uh, Galatians 3.3 3 says. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Is that not the very definition of, of, of drifting and starting in love and starting in the spirit? And now we're trying to accomplish something in my own flesh. And I've now moved into religion where it's just rituals, the things that I'm doing, and it's no longer about the relationship. So I just want to, with, with that said, I, I want to look at the three consequences that I've, I've kind of discovered in, um, that, that happen when we're in religion. You guys ready? All right. The first one is... Uh, rituals over relationship. 
man, we love rituals. Now, I do, I do want to say about this, though. There's, there's, there's rituals, but there's routine, and there's nothing wrong with routine. And there's nothing wrong with devotion, and there's nothing wrong with rule and regulations, right? I mean, I have a covenant with my wife, and that covenant sets boundaries of what I can and can't do. And it's the same thing with God, right? So when we talk about religion, sometimes the notion, and I've seen this all too often, when, we, when people come out of religion, they kind of, the, the pendulum swings, and now it's a free-for-all. Do whatever you want. There's, there's no consequences. There's, you know, it's, it's about you. They're on these cruises. They're probably on those cruises with Pastor Bob. <laughs> John 5, 3, 9 says, you are busy analyzing the scriptures, frank, frantically pouring over them in hopes of gaining eternal life. Everything you read points to me, yet you refuse to come to me so I can give you life, the life that you're looking for, eternal life. I mean, what's interesting in, is in these rituals, the rituals that I'm engaged in are all about Christ. But I'm, it's, it, there's something that, that becomes numb, and I'm not realizing that I need to step back into that relationship. I can't have the rules and the relationships without God. They can't replace them, and that's what happens. Uh, number two is uh, practical atheism. All right, as Pastor Bob said, uh, being nominal. A practical atheism is a belief system that's rooted in the kingdom of God, but you're the one on the throne. Yeah, been there, done that, got the shirt. Right. It's this form of godliness, but denying its power. So this is, when, when we look at this practically, it's, it's if you have two people that, uh, there's a believer and an unbeliever and an atheist, for example, and they're going through the same issue, if they're going through the exact same resources and aren't coming, there, there's no sense of the kingdom of God breaking in at any point where living practical atheism, where we're, we're just, you know, we're just checking it off, I'm, I'm a Christian, Right? Number three is accepting, uh, we accept the voice of the enemy as our own. Um, let's see here. Second Corinthians says, we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Best example I found of, of this is the book of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Genesis 3. So the serpent comes to Adam and Eve and gives them all this whole spiel. God's lying to you. You need to eat this fruit. This is going to be good for you. Just a couple verses later, we actually read that Eve is repeating what the serpent is saying as, as her own thoughts. This food is good for me, and it will gain me knowledge. Now, here's a secret. It's a bonus. It's not on here. If you're writing down notes, write this down. If you're not, write it down anyways. Um, the second step to that that the enemy does is once he blurs the line and I start hearing his voice as my own, the second step to that is he begins to speak on behalf of God, and I accept that. My wife and I counseled plenty of people. We've had plenty of people come through, and the one thing that I've, we've always noticed is you have somebody that sits with us, and they say, well, oh, man, you know, I'm just a loser. I have nothing going for my life. You know, this is horrible. And we'll ask, well, what does God say about your life? God agrees. No, no, no. That's not the God I know. So there's a, there's a blurring of the lines that happens. And so my, the question that I want to ask, um, or, or, or kind of a, a tidbit that I've I found, is how do, we, how do we stay out of this pitfall? How do we stay out of religion? And one of the things as I was praying that I came to was intentionality. You can't have a good marriage without being intentional. You're not going to stay close to Christ in proximity without intention. It's just not going to happen. I love what this says, Matthew uh, 7, 24 through 27. It's a bit, a bit lengthy, but Jesus basically says here, the person that hears what I'm saying and, and does it is a person that builds his house on a rock. The second part of that is the person that doesn't hear what I'm saying is going to build on the sand. The point of this is whether you're listening to Christ or not, your life is building something. The only difference is if I'm not intentional with building it, then I'm, I have somebody else. I've forfeited the blueprints to somebody else, and somebody else is making those decisions for me. And then I realize, wait a second, why have I drifted, and why am I so far? It's because the enemy is never going to put things in place for us to be closer to God, right? He's going to always drift us further and further from God. And then we realize, oh, man, why am I, why am I in this? And uh, in, in closing, I just want to share my last point. I just want to say, you know, I am... 
I do love revival, but I don't. And here's why. We just took communion, and we just, we just thank God for the sacrifice of his son. I, I don't know if I think that God sent his son to be crucified to give birth to a church that will need to be resuscitated every couple of decades. So maybe a part of what I look at in my life is I don't really care about the revival out on the streets. I care about God rekindling the fire in my heart and being in proximity. And I love what T.D. Jake says. He says, uh, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where there's food. And the truth is, if I'm, I can only give what I have. And so if I'm close to proximity, that's going to be attractive. And that's what I'm going to give people. And that's going to be the definition of revival. Love you guys. Awesome, Abel. Don't go. Hey, don't go yet. Stay there. Let's stand up together. Um, that's some good stuff. You know, I hope, I hope there's been a level of conviction in you. Uh, and let me just say this. I, I personally wouldn't go to a church where I left feeling good all the time. You know what I mean? I go, wow, that was nice. I can watch a movie for nice. I want conviction. I want alignment. I want adjustment. And I, I just want to ask this question. If you bow your head, close your eyes. We could have prayer team leaders. Come on forward. Be ready to pray for you. I, just simple question, you know. I don't convict anyone. I don't. I, I pray the Holy Spirit convicts. How many of you would just say, and Pastor Brandon prayed earlier about the heart condition, but how many of you would just say, in your heart, there's been a relational drift from God? Just slip your hand up and down. I just want to just get a read here. Okay, awesome. Not awesome, but thanks for responding. So we don't ever drift into commitment. We drift away from commitment. And, you know, when, when Jesus addresses the church at Ephesus in Revelation, um, you know what he says? He says, go back and do the first works, which works can get a little messy. You think, oh, now i got to work my way. No, you don't have to work. What, go do what you did at the beginning. And, and it will mean crowding out everything else to make space for the word of God, for the spirit of God, for the things of God. Uh, we're not talking about a human striving here to get right with God. It's, it's accepting his invitation. He initiated it. He wanted this. So, Father, I'm going to pray right now in the name of Jesus for every person here, including myself. God, you see, there is a, there is a, a drift. There is a, a pull, a gravitational pull to just settle. Settle for less than you have willed and purposed and desired for our lives, for my life. And, God, I, I don't want to be nominal. I don't want to be Christian in name only. God, I want to be a lover of God and a lover of people. And so I pray, God, would you interrupt whatever rituals and routines and things that have crowded you out of that space, and would we return to you, God? And I pray that you would give fresh life to every single person in this room. God, that, that repentance that Peter preached about in Acts chapter 3, where he said if you would re repent and if you would return, the times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. People would get their wind back. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, you would help us repent well, adjust our thinking to your thinking. Our thoughts become your thoughts. Your ways become our ways. God, help us in this relationship. Live as you would have us, cooperating with your eternal purposes in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So be it. Church.